Okay, I started out when I was about 20, 19 years old, when I got involved in my first property. I'm from a business family, but I was also raised very poor from the one side. It's a long story. But uh, this guy came to me, Arthur Nkosi, and he and I was sitting in my flat in Sunnyside on the, on the third floor, and he had a flat on the fourth floor. And for some reason, he came to me and he told me I must buy his flat. And I was very arrogant with him that stage, and I said, why would I buy in Sunnyside? Where are you from? And I just left him and I went to my job, which paid me two and a half, three thousand rand a month that time. I couldn't even afford the petrol in my car going there. But then it actually made, I made sense by renting out this flat, what this guy told me yesterday. And what I'm figuring out with the numbers while I'm driving to work, this actually sounds like, like a good deal. I'm going to make 500 rand after paying the bond and renting the flat out. And I almost rolled my car to phone this afternoon course back and say, yes, he's sorry about yesterday. I'm going to want to buy this flat. And I don't know why I did it, but he came back to me that very same night and he pre presented me with a purchase agreement and he told me how to buy, how to, how to sign a purchase agreement because I didn't know. And I bought this flat. The amazing thing of it all is when he left, he told me, sell the flat and put 50, 60 K, you're going to sell it within a week. <laughs> <laughs> and I wondered, where, where, where are you coming from? You know, what the hell? So I said, okay, I'll put 90,000 to it and let's see what happens. I didn't even get my bond. It was already sold and I made 90,000 out of it. Coming, who was Mr. Nkosi? Mr. Nkosi in the 70s, he started to realize that the apartheid can't carry on in the 60s and 70s and he started buying up and getting land in, in Soweto. And when the, when the new government came into place, where was the place to have property? Soweto. All those developments and the shopping centers and stuff. And he had this vision. And I don't know why still today he, didn't, he, he helped me out, but he helped me out. And that's how I got into property. When I sold that flat, I then very quickly learned what a bond originator is, what a transferring attorney is, and I bought the flat across the road, and I bought two, and then I saw in the building next door, and that's how we started out playing property, getting to know the market in Sunnyside very well. So that's where I started out. I then started um, the, my rental company, where we did rentals, we did investment sales, we did actually very good in, in, the, in the investment sales side of things. I also had a sectional title company, which also grew very big, but it kept me very busy, so I sold it about two years ago. It was also a very successful company today. I got a security company called 365 Security Services, and I got a construction company called Root Corp, where we do developments, maintenance, to service ourselves in this. And then I'm going into the game farming in Stella, Northwest. So this is my business, business background. Okay. Before I start to invest, before you start investing in property, understand the following. These are my rules that I guide by and that I use when I, when I think a lot, when I think property. What is the rat race? You can tell me what is the rat race. You all know the rat race, eh? It is when you live from paycheck to paycheck. And that's exactly what you're trying to break through property investment and through investing in properties to get passive on your income. So the rat race is where we find ourselves and that's where we want to get out. That's feeling of you're waiting for the first to get your paycheck and by the fifth it's all gone and then you're waiting for the first again. None of us wants to live like that, eh? Like Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Have you guys read the book Rich Dad, Poor Dad before? And what an amazing book. If you haven't read the book, Reach That Poor Dad, I really advise you to read the book, Reach That Poor Dad. If you've got children, do yourself a favor, do them a favor and go buy them the book, Reach That Poor Dad. Let them read it. You can read there. People find themselves living from paycheck to paycheck and will never be financially independent from their employer. That's the truth. And I believe that property is the only tool that safely can get you out of the rat race. What is the difference between a rich person and a wealthy person? Who can tell me what's the difference? Uh, poor and middle class people work for money, and the rich and money work for them. Yeah. A rich man will commonly say, I've got a bag full of money. But the wealthy guy will say that I measure my wealth over time. This is also one of the things that property gives us. And this is what you need to understand in property. It's not a short term investment, it's a long term investment. So you, I will commonly, so uh, investor will, prop, a proper property investor will commonly say that I, I live one generation, two generations, five years. 
that he can operate without getting any income. Only through his investments. He doesn't need to have workable income. But your rich man will have money in his pocket. He will come and say, I can buy whatever my eye can see. So when we invest in property, we build on wealth. And we build over time. What is the difference between a passive and an active income? That's right. No work, no pay. Active income. What does property investment do for you? Gives you little work. I'm not going to say no work. Gives you little work. Constant income. This is where we're heading at when we want to start building up our property profiles. When we start investing in properties, these are the core things that we have to keep in our back mind so we know where we are going to and what is it that we want to achieve out of it. What is the difference between an asset and a liability? Asset uh, is the, so when the money comes in and the liability when it goes out. So it's of your own property. Asset is something that makes you money. A liability is something that costs you money. When we build up our property profiles, our rental incomes, the value of our properties, we're trying to exceed our liabilities. You can do that in a very short period of time. Two, three, four years. Depends on your liabilities, but it's very possible. But those are the things that we keep in mind. What is the advantages of investing in property? You don't need bags full of money to get in the, into the game. Just, you don't need millions of rands, hundreds and thousands of rands to get into the game of property. You need to afford it. You need to show to the bank you can afford a bond, apply for a bond and buy your property. You pay for your transfer duties. If you deal with proper agents, proper your infrastructures, which I'll get later to add, you can deal with these issues as well. But you do not need to be a rich person to get into the game. That's very important to know. Anyone can be a successful property investor. Any person in this whole year can be successful in property and act can actually start investing in property. Doesn't matter your personality or anything. Very much introverts, people that I know, that's highly successful in property. And extroverts, a lot of guys, different personalities, different properties. You can still carry on with your day job. You don't need to quit your day job to invest in property. Because property you buy was through your, your, through your estate agents, through your connections where you source your property from. You don't resign. You, in actual fact, you're trying to get your rental income to exceed, to, to match your salary. So you don't need to resign your day job to, to become a property investor. It's a safe investment. Can anyone give me any other form of investment here that's safer than property investment? And you don't need money, you don't need bags full of money to invest in it either. Legacy bill, that's very important to me. I've got four children. So I want to leave a legacy. I want to see my children going forward in property. I want my children to live their passion one day. This is probably my biggest drive in property today. Is, is building up properties for my kids to carry on with them. And they can follow their, they, they can follow their dreams. I don't care what my kids come and tell me what they want to become one day. As long as they understand property, as long as they know how to play the game and play the game, they can do whatever they want to. Safety net for your business. This is very important. This saved me how many times already. All got businesses, cash flows. You know what business is all about, guys. Up and down, up and down. What better form to go borrow money to put into your business than property? What better form can you get out there to get cash into your business? There is no, I don't know of anyone. Anything, I don't have a better plan there. So this saved me many times before. We either go take a second bond on a, on a property, or in the very rare cases where I will go and sell a property, depends on how quickly I need the cash. 
but this is property. I always say in my businesses, I'm not there to make money out of my businesses. My business is there to help me to buy more property. And I live my money off my property that I'm buying. So this is important. When you do have a business, try and get a property profile behind your business. It will save you one day. Different types of property. There's two main properties that we look at when we invest in property. There's lots of others. We've got farmland, we've got different types. But the two main property types that we are looking for when we invest in property, the sectional title and full title. How do we identify a flat when we want to buy it? How do we know we're going to invest in this flat or not? What are we looking for when we get to the building? Are we going to invest here or are we not going to invest in this building? What are the points we're looking for? Anyone tell me? Financial. The financials, very important. We have to get rental income, not to pay off levies. So we need to look at the, at the financial. What is the levies? We look at the building. Is it face brick or is it plastered? That makes it, that makes, that forms very much part of your decision making. Look at the land, the, the common property, is it clean, is it neat? Is there control over the building? That's what we are looking for. And then the other thing also, when we invest in sectional title, you don't have the headaches of root leaking roofs, because it's the body corporate where you pay levy towards. There's a lot of advantages for purchasing in a sectional title than what it will be in a full title. I'm a king on sectional title, not as much full title, though I have much. Uh, I have full titles as well. There's full title property. It's a property that's a standalone usually. You're responsible for the roof, the garden, all the, all the things that you can see. When sectional title, you're only responsible for inside what you can see. But when you walk on the outside of the premises, you've got a common body, the board of trustees, where you also form part of who's responsible, but your direct responsibility is with inside your unit. As where with your full title, you're responsible for everything outside and inside, which makes a difference to your decision making whether we're going to be investing in this property or not. Building your property portfolio. What is your game plan? Each and every one in this hall here today, myself, got different game plans, we've got different goals, we've got different visions. There's different ways of how we're going to achieve our goals. You've got guys that do, I call it the slingshot, where they will buy 20 flats, they will sell 10, they will put the remaining profit in the remaining 10, and then get those properties paid off quicker. There's other guys that will, there's lots of game plans. I'm not going to mention all of them, but there's a hell of a lot. But you need to go figure out what is your game plan. What is your personal situation, and how are you going to get out of it, and how are you going to get into the property investment? There's no position that, that you can be in that can prevent you from going into the property investment. It might be ITC, then your first, obviously your first game plan is to get off the ITC, get your stuff paid up. But you need to sort out your game plan, first of all. There's just a property chart of where you will stand before you get into investing in property. Is your active income your workable income? goes into your bank account, goes to your liabilities, you pay off your liabilities, and the most of us don't have a lot of dispense capital left afterwards. And it's that number that the banks will be looking at when they will grant you your bond or not. So you want that number to be high. What happens when you retire? What happens when you lose your job? What happens when something happens to you in life? Your basic, your incomes fall away. But you still have the liabilities to pay. And that's where property investment comes into play. You can do this alongside your profession that you're currently running. I used the word eight because I found that the common property investor, the norm, norm is eight properties, more or less. Eight properties, it's four and a half thousand rand per property, gives him an extra 36,000. So he tries to match his rental income with his workable income. That's your very first goal when you start out in, in, in investing in property is to get your rental income to match your, your workable income. And that's when you can start break. And that's when you start playing different games, going into development, going into this, going into that. But my advice to you would be to first meet that number there. And can you see where your disposable income goes? Can you see that the banks will now start borrowing you more money, more money? So the bigger you go, if your structures are right, I'm not going to be talking about structures tonight, trusts and PTYs, etc. But then you'll also get your access to finance easier. Now you can go on retirement. 
Now you can say, okay, now I've got an income of 36,000 Rand. I don't have to work anymore. And you can still pay your liabilities and you can still have a passive active on the end of the day. And you can do all of this within 10 years. I think you had a number now no, where you said if you pay 20% more, you'd pay it off in 12, 13 years. So you can settle your properties within 10 years if you work your financials right without costing you too much money. And I will show you how to do it. I just don't have the time here to do it tonight. But this is where you're striving at as your, as your first level when you want to invest in property. This is where you want to be at. There you go, your first property. Go to your second property. Go to your fourth property. And there you go to your eight properties. Can you see here, uh, we're talking rental income, 36,000, but are we talking about the, as the value of the properties? 3.6 million rand when you've got eight properties. This you can achieve in four years, really easy. Not, not a too big a problem if your credit records and everything is clear and you run your financials properly. You can achieve this in five years. And you, who doesn't want to do this? Because I don't, I don't understand when I meet people and they say they're not investing in property. I can't understand that. I always ask why, what's wrong with you? Why are you not investing in property? <laughs> property management. That's very important. How do you manage your portfolio afterwards? I think this is the topic that put most people off from investing in property. Because I'm not going to collect my rent. The tenants is going to break my flat, etc, etc, etc. Get the right team behind you. It's very, very, very important. The right auditor. You have to get the right order to get your financials correct. The bank wants to borrow you the money as bad as you want to borrow the money. The problem is what are you telling the bank? What are you showing the bank? For them to be able to borrow you the money. If you've got the right auditors behind you, your financials and your stuff, you might have an easier ride with the bank. Believe me, I fight with this and the bond originators, they, <laughs> this is always an issue. But you get the right auditors behind you. Your bank, or bank originator, Christian, have a relationship with your bank originator. Know who's your bank originator. I phone my bank originator every day. If I don't speak to her in a week, I phone her, what's wrong? You have to have a, a very strong relationship with your bank originator that becomes your best friend when you become a property investor. Because they are the person that knows your stuff. They are those your financials. Every time when you want to buy a property, they got your bank statements already. They know who you are. They know who you deal with. It's a matter of filling out, signing there, and off you go. Legal. Who's your lawyer? Who's your transferring attorney? Who advises you? In which identities and structures are you going to be purchasing these properties in? You'll probably buy about five, six, seven properties if you're lucky. Then you're going to have to start looking at trusts. A PTYs, in what identities are you buying these properties? Remember, we have to keep the bank happy. And obviously your safety nets also. Lots of reasons why we put our properties in PTYs and trusts. But you need the right legal advice, your transferring attorney. If you start buying a lot of property up, you start getting discount from them as well. So it's very important to build the, the relationship with the right lawyer. Your rental agent. Probably the most important decision that you can make is who do you appoint managing your property? What is a proper rental agent? What, what can you expect from a proper rental agent? Well, first and foremost, they do ITC and credit checks on the tenant that they place in your property. It's crucial to make sure that they do that. I've met agencies that does not do that. And then I've met agencies that really does it very well. They need to scrutinize the tenant, the potential tenant, before they move into your property. The legality, the legal work, the contracts. I've been in court more than once where I've been hammered on contracts that wasn't signed properly. It's very important for these things to be correctly. Let me give you an example. An in inspection needs to be signed by both parties. How many times do we meet it when an inspection is not signed by both parties? If it's not signed by both parties, you pay that guy's deposit back if he's clever, if he knows what he's doing. You're going to pay. So there's a lot of legalities around this. If the rental agent does the right job by placing the right tenant, your risks of having a tenant not paying rent goes down to maybe 5%. So it's crucial to have the right managing agent, the rental agent that manages your property and build a relationship with this rental agent as well. When you buy into sectional title, 
It's crucial to know your board of trustees. Know who's the chairperson. Have uh, gratitude towards those people because they're going out of their way managing your building. They determine what the levy is going to be. How they spend your money, the levy money. How are they managing this building? We have to advance our building. We have to get our building into a better space. Paying levies as low as possible. Know your board of trustees. There's a lot of things around your board of trustees and your managing agent that you should be aware of. So be, be conscious and know what's going on there. Maintenance your property. Spend someone, go there once a year, twice a year, just to go do a toolbox job. Fix up little screws. If you maintain your property properly, you can also see what's going on in your flat. Who's staying in your flat? What's the condition of your flat? Your rental agent should send you photos. But maintenance is crucial to do. Don't take shortcuts there. And then, obviously, managing your cash flow. While you're renting out the property is getting. What I do, what helps me a lot, is my debit orders goes down on the 15th of every month. Not the 1st. Because a lot of investors, their debit orders run on the 1st, or the 2nd, or the 3rd of every month. And then they start fighting to get their rental income in that they have to pay their own money into paying the bank back. If you just move your debit order to the 15th of every month, you give your rental agent gap until the 7th to pay you your rental money over. That's a reasonable time. And then you got up until the 10th to say, okay, I've got my rental income in. I can actually pay my bond on the 15th. If I don't have my rental income by the 10th, I've still got five days to make sure that I get to pay the bank back on the 15th. Just take that stress off your back and you'll find that it helps, you. It helps a lot in your cash flow management. Because you know, if you bounce one debit order, I think the banks have got, what, six months that they won't look at you? Or give you hassles at? <laughs> I remember years ago, that fight I had a lot of times with them. So manage your cash flow properly. I always say when I purchase a property, I would always like to have two payments in a bank account ready. So if I purchase a property, I will put it in a separate bank account where the debit orders goes off. And in that bank account for every property, I've got two bond payments in that account ready already. So I've got two months that I don't have to receive rent and I can still pay the bank back. Because it happens when a tenant doesn't pay here or there, but very few and far few in between if you have the right managing agent. But manage your cash flow. Okay. Any questions? Right. Okay, guys, so I've got some questions that was written down before. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to alternate them. So I'm going to ask one and then we'll go to the audience and we'll ask one again, go to the audience and so on. So the first question here, should I look at a radius for my properties, Jody? Um, one area or many areas? That all depends on yourself whether you want to look at different areas or in, 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 in one area. I prefer one area. The reason for it is simple. I know the buildings in that area. I get to know that building's name, that building's name. Who's the caretaker? I get to pick up more leads because I know what I'm looking for. If I say to you, I've got an Overton in the market for 300,000 Rand, who's going to purchase it? Yeah, because you got an Overton. <laughs> You understand? A lot of these type of things, I've bought many properties before by knowing my property, knowing my buildings. And I buy this property, I don't even go look at the property. Because the price is right, I don't care whether that thing is, what color the flat is or what the condition is inside. So I'm a, I'm a full stander of get a local area, know your area and start investing within your area. You will move out later, but keep in your area. Alright, so questions from the audience. Any questions for John Lee? Anyone with a question? Not everyone all at once. Um, Devon. Um, it's more uh, not really a question. As your story, you told us how you got started in property, and we all learn through stories, and we all get encouraged by people's successes. Um, your success story has been fantastic, but could you extrapolate a little bit further after you bought those few initial properties? What do you think was the single most thing that fast tracked? your property portfolio and your growth into wealth? The people I mixed myself with, the company that I kept myself in, 
I went out. I wanted to know all property investors. I wanted to know the bank. I knew the bank manager for whatever reason. But I went out knowing people, mixing myself up with people in the same industry. I always say, if you want to become somewhere, if you want to go somewhere in life, Go see who is there already and go befriend those people. I think that is one question, you know, uh, one main thing. And I'm still like that today. I'm still like that today. I always love to speak to property investors and what are they doing. I've got one friend, I'm not going to mention his name nor his company's name. This guy's got 1,800 residential units in Pretoria. 1,800. He's got two shopping centers and he's got two very big developments. I'm not going to mention the developments now. But let me tell you something. This guy's turnaround on his rental income is 13 million rand per month. This is serious money we're talking about. And it's always nice for me when I speak to people like that. How did you start? Where did you start? What did you do? What was your mentality? And what I was trying to share with you tonight was what's my mentality. These things that I know, those are the few things that's important to me. Any other questions? Excellent. Um, there's a question. If I have an issue with one of my properties, can I phone you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're more than welcome. I think Rikas, where's Rikas? He gave out pamphlets with our telephone numbers. You're more than welcome. I'm always open for a property chat. I love property chat. It doesn't matter where, when in the day, phone me, make an appointment. I will make time and sit with you and discuss your individual, what I would have done if I was in your position. I'm not a property coach. I'm passionate about property. So then but I, will, I will definitely sit with you. All right. Sit. How do you say that? There's too many, too many mistakes. <laughs> Hi, um, do you have any experience in uh, buying property from um, a share of auction and what's the experience like? Did someone ask you to ask me that question? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do. First of all, when you buy property from a share of auction, make sure you got the funding for it. Don't bid higher than what you, um, if you, if you don't know you're going to get the money to pay for that property. What happened to me? I think I was 25, and I was in Sunnyside, you know, Loftus Versfeld, the Blobola. And it was full Minar auction years, I'll never forget it. We came past there in the street, it was Park Street. And my lawyer friend was sitting next to me, and there was this auction board, properties going on auction, Sunnyside. And me being Mr. Sunnyside, I convinced him we're going to buy property there now. But I had a couple of beers, I also have to say that. <laughs> So we, I'll never forget this day. So we walked in and we sat there and we're going to buy property. We're not loaded school. <laughs> so we, we walked into the auction here and I said, okay, but I don't have money. I can't pay my, um, the, my deposit because you pay the deposit to get a, get a ticket number. So they knew me and they just gave me a bloody ticket number when I didn't pay for it. So I stood night next to Lawrence and I think we bought up like 20 odd flats that one night. That the hammer was felled upon us. And we paid a deposit, 10% deposit. It was a couple hundred K that we had to pay there. The 10% deposit that you have to pay when, when, when the bid is uh, coming to you. The bad thing of it all is we must getting our bonds. Bonds is not a problem. So when we went to the banks to get the loans, all of those properties was declined. We couldn't get bonds. That was just when the, when the um, Credit Act, I think, came in. That was just, just around about that time. That was, yeah, the moral of this story, don't be arrogant. You never get arrogant in property. It's so easy to make money in property, really. There's, there's no brain science to property. Follow the core rules and you are going to make money in property. But we, all those bonds were declined. That was the fastest that I sold property in my life before because I sold all those property off within a week. And we cross-dealed cross them so we at least we got our deposits back. So yeah, I do have it, uh, uh, knowledge of, of share of auctions. Also bear in mind your rates and taxes and your levies. They say they estimate. So before you buy, you have to know. You can't work on estimations. What is the levies in the rears? What is the rates and taxes in the rears? What is the state of the tenant inside the property? And before you buy, you do have to have to do some little bit of homework before you buy on a share of auction. Awesome. All right. Last question on this side. What is the biggest mistake you have seen property investors make? 
Well, I told you about arrogancy already. I'm not going to go there. I think arrogancy is the biggest mistake you can go when you go into property investment. The other thing is when we talk about rental income, you know, when you say to the, te the tenant, and I think just, pro uh, just property, maybe you'll agree with me there. He now told you that property is declining in, the, in, the, in rental. It's a little bit, but it's going. And I agree with him 100% there. But now you've got this property and you want 5,500 Rand a month for it. And you've got this great tenant, right profile, right everything, and it's 5,200 Rand, for example. Now you decline that offer and uh, not, not, not putting the tenant in to save two or to make an extra 200 Rand a month. What happens now? Your property goes empty for a month. How much money did you lose that one month? So rather just go down the 200 Rand. Make those numbers. Before you just decline an offer, really look at your tenant. Don't be penny wise and pound foolish. So there's one word I can use. All right, next one to the audience. Anyone else with a question? What happens if you have bought a few properties and you've got a bad experience with the tenants and you cannot afford to pay the payments for the loss? Yeah, that I had as well. Not very much though, because I use the right agencies to rent out my property. Okay, yeah. If you hear someone in the marketplace say, yeah, but they've, their tenants have been sitting for a year in their property and not paying rent. There's someone who's not doing their job. That I can tell you now. I've got a system in place with my stuff, 15,000 Rand. Uh, with an unbestreed, what is the English word for it? With an unopposed, usually you don't get a post when you go for an eviction order. So it's 15,000 rand, three months to get the eviction going. I've done it before as well. So does that answer your question? I, ha I eat hard first time. My contracts are very clear. You pay your rent on time. When I do get a phone call from a tenant stating that I I'm going into a difficult time, I'll evaluate the, the, the past history that I got with this guy, and then I'll make an arrangement. If he doesn't keep to arrangement, I hit hard when I hit. I don't play with a tenant that does not pay his rent. Because rent is the first thing, the first most important thing on your budget, is the roof over your head. So, does that answer your question? All right, guys, any more questions? Any questions? Going, going, there we go. Mr. Manana, sir. Hi, John. So that's a good question. You mentioned that you own the decisional charity management business as well. So I suppose you, you buy properties, you firstly invest in them, and then you move to, to similar businesses that are related to property. Decisional charity is one of them, charity management is one of them. Why did you say it? What was wrong with that type of business? I'm asking for something I'm going to do. You can't go wrong going into that business. Let me first of all say that to you. There's a lot of money in that business. Going into the sectional title business also gives you a very broad spectrum of other businesses that you can go into. Um, purchasing of properties, you're the first one to know about property that goes into the market. Knows what's going on in your buildings. Um, now I can give you a lot of advantages of owning a company like that. You can also start several other companies off that company. You get my number and we can have a chat about it. The reason why I sold that company, it kept me busy too much. It kept my focus off what I was actually doing. I got the security firm, I got the construction firm, I do development as well. So it was a combination of that. And I'm a very hands-on type of person. I'm involved in every little thing. People in my office knows that as well. And it kept me busy every second night I'm in an AGM. I'm in a trustee meeting. So it's a very ungrateful business, I can warn you there. But it's a good business if you manage it properly. That was the reasons why I sold it. And it was a good business. It was a very good business. Right. Anyone else? Can I have a full this time? <laughs> Going once? Going twice? Not sold. All right. I just want to finish the invitation. Guys, so like I said, you got the invitation from Rikas. Please feel free to contact me. Ask me questions. You've got my details. Come and see me. I have a passion for property. I will sit with you individually and tell you what I would have done if I was in your position or help you to work out your first strategy and your goal line. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you.
Thank you so much for some feelings you want to be shot.